Greetings, comrades and members Gigantles. Welcome to another episode of Gigantles Theory. This episode will be seeing, as you can see from the title, whether or not the Ten Plagues could have happened naturally, or in a more materialistic route. You see, this was inspired by a couple of things. So one, back when I uh, lived in my college room, and I was like, well, yeah. back when I lived in my university room, I binge-watched the Plague of the, the Prince of Egypt 20 times on Netflix, like a month. And... Netflix then removed it for some reason, which I was very upset about. However, I've got the original VHS tape from my home country, downstairs somewhere, wherever I keep my VHS tapes. Now, yes, I'm old enough to have VHS tapes. And I've also got it out. They're recorded on TV now, which I'm glad, because Prince of Egypt, brilliant movie. Love it. I love the Plague song, by the way. It's just absolutely... Let's be honest. The Plague song has been one of the greatest songs ever written. Anyway, so, love that movie. And when I was busy dealing with a, but with dealing with a couple of guys on Facebook... For some reason, the movie that I'd seen a little while back, called The Reaping, uh, came up came up from the deepest, darkest recesses of my memory. Now, the, the Reaping is basically meant to be a, almost like the, the plagues happening in the modern day. So, long. I'm not going to give the whole plot if you want to watch it. You don't want, don't watch the movie. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible movie. It shows a lack of understanding of the ten plagues. However, basically, the whole point of the movie is that this town is experiencing uh, the ten, what appears to be the ten plagues. So, according to the woman. She tries to uh, the one the one okay the main character. She tries to explain away the twi- the ten plagues by saying there's no god behind it. It's just a natural process. So according to her, her theory goes along the lines of there was an algae bloom in the Nile, which poisoned the which then poisoned the river, which then caused all the frogs to leave. The frogs then died, and these frogs had lice on them. So then, the f- which then uh, called, which then led to that the third plague. Then the flies came to feed on the dead frogs, right? Then the anthrax killed the uh, livestock. Then the humans were infected from the fly bites, which gave them boils. And then, the, then there was a coincidental thunderstorm of of hail, which destroyed, of uh, which destroyed the crop. You know, meteorological event coincidence. And then this promoted a, a locust swarm to come over and swarm everything. And then a dust cloud came along and blotted out the sun. And then the uh, the fish that had been poisoned by the red algae were eaten. And then, because the firstborn had the largest portion in those days, they suffered more than anyone else and died. Now, this is actually a load of rubbish. It shows a complete uh, lack of understanding of the plagues and nature. Yeah, as I see, it, as I said, it's a terrible, mo- it's a terrible movie. This is based uh, partly upon the ideas of Greta Hort, who was an Egyptologist. She she believed that there was a chain reaction of events which uh, caused the ten plagues. However, they collapse when you do research into it. So I'm just going to give you a rundown of it on why it doesn't work. So according to her, there was an algae bloom at the at the same time as heavy rains from the north in you know in the upper in the upper Nile somewhere in Ethiopia. It washed a lot of red dust into the Nile, you know, from the Abyssinian Plateau, and it basically deox- this combined with the algae deoxygenated the water and then killed the fish, which then uh, promoted the growth of anthrax, which which as the frogs were leaving, they were contaminated with anthrax and then they died outside the Nile. This all happened apparently during the time the Nile flooded, then promoted the uh, re- the reproduction of mosquitoes at that point in time, and the biting flies. Because as the Nile, as the flood, flood the Nile waters receded, there were all these pools of stagnant water, and so then the, all these mosquitoes went around biting everyone and then giving diseases. And the anthrax from these rotting frogs apparently uh, infected the livestock, and they died. And then from these biting flies, this anthrax and transferred to the Egyptians, which then gave them boils. The hail and fire from the sky was meant to be a coincidental meteorological event, which brought in the locusts. The desert sandstorm, apparently, after the Nile receded, it left behind a lot of dust all over Egypt. And so then a, co- a coincidental, another meteorological event, sent up a huge dust storm from all this red dust, which apparently blotted out the sun for a large period of time. And then, as for her to explain the tenth plague, she said that it wasn't the destruction of the firstborn, but rather the first fruits. And that was basically meant to talk about the majority of the harvest having been destroyed by everything, so no one actually died uh, from this tenth plague, or you know, the angel from you know from the firstborn of Egypt dying. So no firstborn, just first fruits of the harvest. And because of this, this made the Bible seem inerrant and corrupted. However, this show actually shows a very poor understanding of what actually happened. You see. This entire th- her entire theory relies on how the Nile turned red, and she got that wrong, which immediately means everything else collapsed afterwards. You see, the algae she proposed uh, for the Nile turning red were well, it, it wasn't just one species of algae; it was actually two. One was 
Hemotococcus plavi plavialis. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. And then the second one was Euglena sanguine sanguinea. Something like that. You, you guys will know how to pronounce it. And it was meant to, this was meant to turn the muddy waters of the Nile blood red. However, in flowing water, these algae aren't red, but green. After a hundred years of study or so of the algae, blue, of the different types of algae living in the Nile, they have found over 400 types. However, not one of these two types of algae live there. I mean, or even any of the, I mean, these two aren't even found in any other thousand species of algae living anywhere in eastern Africa. None of these algae actually cause harmful algae blooms, pollute the water, or make it undrinkable. They're actually so good for us that they're used in plant and animal supplements for food, in food. Seriously, these two algae can't, these two algae don't poison you. I mean, you could say, okay, maybe there's another type of algae, but which one then? You've got to provide some evidence for that. Right, so clearly these, out this algae, it couldn't have poisoned the fish and it couldn't even even, po even poison the humans either. So, so clearly there are different versions of events for how these algae poison everything is wrong. The second point about this concerns the fish itself. You see, other than the fact that this algae doesn't kill fish, fish only die of anoxia, which is lack of oxygen, after an algae bloom, which algae blooms can't really occur very well in, in, in muddy water, which I'll cover later. The reason why the fish died was because they couldn't live in blood. Okay, it was genuine blood. You'll see what I mean in a minute. The third problem with uh, with a with a theory is that she is that she said that the Nile mud it was that the mud around the Nile was red, which helped promote the water turning red. The majority of the mud around the Nile is actually brown. If there was enough mud to create to have dried out and create the dust storm that blocked out the sun for several days for the ninth plague, there would have been no light whatsoever underwater, and that would have killed the algae causing the algae bloom. Also, mud is known for its, for its unique property of flocculation. Due to electrostatic charges on the, on the molecules in mud, the, part, the mud particles stick together and they also stick onto anything around them, and which, then, which then the weight increases and causes it to drop out of suspension. When the, when the Nile is silt-lidden at its, at its high point, so basically full of mud, it's completely clear of algae because of this. You see, if you have all these mud particles floating around, they'll just stick to the algae and then cause it to be too heavy to, to be anywhere near the surface and cause it to drop out of suspension. So it would have basically killed all the algae because they couldn't photosynthesize. So the mud now turning to red for her theory to work doesn't work at all. It contradicts her theory. It can't be mud or it couldn't be mud and algae. It had to be one or the other. And clearly none of them support, none of them support each other anyway or in, together or individually. Besides, if the problem was, if the Nile turning red was due to mud, the Egyptians wouldn't have panicked as much as they did previously. I mean, how do you sort out muddy water? Simple, you grab a container full of water, you leave it alone for a few hours, and then all the mud will gradually settle at the bottom of the, of the container, leaving behind uh, just water, or you could just strain it if you had to find enough filter. However, this isn't what happened. They genuinely panicked when this, when this occurred. And in Exodus 7, 19 to 20, it tells us that the Nile immediately turned to blood. There wasn't time for gradual build-up from the source down to the mouth of the Nile. It was an immediate change. It started at Pharaoh's palace when they went to, when they interrupted him during his bath. So after Aaron, remember, Aaron, this, the, the Nile turned to blood after Aaron stuck his staff in the water, right? That happened at Pharaoh's palace when he was going out to have his morning bath, which clearly isn't at the source of the Nile. It was how it was much further down and from that center, from that point it spread outwards it spread out all over Egypt I mean remember this didn't just occur in the Nile remember that the Bible tells us that it all it occurred in other streams and ponds pools rivers bodies of water and even vessels of wood and stone all throughout Egypt it wasn't just confined to the Nile so unless somehow the algae and mud decided hey let's go through the groundwater even though we're not we're too big for the holes in the in the porous rock there's no way it could have spread throughout all of Egypt if it was mud and water, if it was mud and algae. It was definitely something else that turned all the water throughout Egypt to blood. The next point of concern for the theory is anthrax. Apparently she doesn't know how anthrax works. You see, anthrax doesn't occur, isn't, it's not waterborne. It's spores that occur, it's anthrax bacteria are spores in the soil, not in water. It doesn't affect aquatic animals, whether or not they're alive or dead. As due to that, fish and frogs cannot be infected with anthrax. Besides, in, in Exodus 8-11, some of the frogs returned to the Nile after this plague ended. 
I mean, remember, the, fro the frogs didn't leave during when it was still blood or algae bloomed or mud, whatever. No, it said that the plague of blood cleared up. And then the frogs left the water after everything became clear. Some of the frogs returned back to another, and it's very clear that they couldn't have been sick, or they couldn't have all been contaminated and sick with anthrax. It should be impossible for them to, collect, to contract in the first place. Anthrax, remember, the anthrax infects mammals, usually cattle, which they feed on the contaminated soil in the first place. And then if we hang around that area too, we may contract it. But frogs don't contract anthrax, so I don't know how they could be contaminated with it. Next point of concern with her theory are the biting flies which she believes were sto Stomoxis calcitrans. Here's the thing, anthrax isn't, as I said before, anthrax is, it cont is contracted through spores from soil. It's not contracted through animals. Okay, it's not contracted through flies, and those flies don't eat dead animals. There isn't a single veterinary, medical veterinary case in history of an anthrax infected fly bites on people or cattle. That's what I'm talking about. Couldn't have been, those flies couldn't have transferred any anthrax whatsoever. Next point of concern, which is the big assumption she's making here, is the Nile being in flood. No way in Exodus does it say that the Nile was in flood at this point in time. In Exodus 7.15, it tells us that Moses met Pharaoh on the bank of the Nile, not they were in boats on the flooded plain. If the Nile flooded, those banks of the Nile wouldn't exist for a few, or quite a long period of time. Which means that the Nile was clearly not in flood at this point in time. Or even in Exodus 7.24, which it tells us that the Egyptians tried to dig in the banks of the Nile to find water. How would they do this if the Nile was flooded? She's made a very big assumption here that the Nile was flooded, yet there's nothing to support this. The next point of concern for her theory is that she still doesn't explain where the fire from the hill came from. She may just say, okay, well, it was just a freak meteorological event coincidence, this hail. But the Bible very clearly, des clearly describes this hail as burning when it reaches the ground. She doesn't explain this. How, how, how can she just simply say it was just hail when it describes it as burning? It doesn't sound like normal hail to me. Which then leads on to the second uh, meteorological of a coincidence here. She says the painted that ninth plague is explained by a massive uh, dust cloud going up, just basically blocking out the sun for a while. Here's the thing though, this storm has this, this part of the th this ninth plague has to tie in with the early ones for it to work, right? This is, this is all linked together, right? Along with all the frogs and the flies and the locusts and everything. But the problem with this is that there would have been a lot of water introduced from the hail that she proposed for her theory. For some reason though, she doesn't seem to give a period of time needed between these plagues, because all that mud, which had been wet from after being laid down during the flood, uh, the, during the Nile flood, and during the, uh, after the hail melted, she doesn't explain how long it would have taken for the, all that mud to dry out in the first place and get blown up into the air. I mean, this, this occurred in a few hours. It didn't take weeks to form or days, but this storm, blew up in just a matter of hours. Besides, the Egyptians are pretty, as you can imagine being a desert nation, they would have been pretty used to dust storms. The, this dust storm is described as having caused absolute darkness for three days. If it was just a normal uh, dust storm, then the Egyptians wouldn't have been concerned with it, but they clearly were. So, and then the final one she's tried to explain is the first fruits. She seems to completely ignore the entirety of Exodus 11, 1 to 13, 16, which this very clearly describes in depth how it wasn't, how the, it wasn't first fruits here, but the firstborn male of all the cattle and people in Egypt died. I don't know if maybe in her vocabulary she, for some reason, seemed to think that people and cattle were fruits or crops or whatever, but she seems to have skipped this part entirely. It's like she seems to be just, you know, just picking and choosing what to believe, which <laughs> never goes well in history. However, this doesn't mean that there isn't a natural explanation for some of the ten plagues. You see, the eighth plague, which uh, which is a plague of locusts, is described as an east wind uh, bringing the locusts in uh, Exodus 10:13, and then the, and wind changed direction, sending all the locusts west to the Red Sea, where they all died in Exodus 10:19. However, this is the only plague that can be explained through natural means. However, if these plagues are just purely natural events, why have they never been repeated in history? I mean, if you, if these are natural, surely they should be repeating on some sort of regular basis. I mean, maybe. Hundreds, maybe, maybe hundreds or a thousand years apart, but it's only happened once like this. All of these events coincide, coinciding with each other only happened once. Why never again? An interesting thing to read, though a bit, a bit cautious about taking it as solid evidence, is something known as the the Leyden Papyrus, which apparently describes some of these plagues and the anarchy that followed afterwards, which would fit Exodus perfectly. But because it would be taking it a bit out of context, if we use this for evidence for Exodus, 
it's a bit cautious to do so. I mean, even the Red Sea, not, not everything that happened to the Red Sea was an entirely natural event. In, in uh, Exodus 1421, it says that the wind blew all night and the sea ended up parting, which sounds, a re- sounds, sounds about natural, right? You know, it takes a while to push that body, to separate a body of water that large. However, what's unnatural about this is, ex- is seen in Exodus 1422, which it describes as a wall of water to the left and right, not just the gentle slope. No, it describes as a wall of water. So if for, for those of you who have seen Exodus Gods and, of Gods and Kings, which is a terrible movie, don't watch it again, they plead and do their research, you can imagine that the, the process when, they, when, the Ned, when the Red Sea splits, it's similar to that with the wind blowing. Instead of just weird water spouts holding back the entire ocean and then just a gentle slope up, uh, up the river it would have been more like a wall of water seen in the prince of egypt this wall of water these walls of water immediately collapsed when moses held up his, when moses held up his hand because the first time he held up his hand the, water, the wind started blowing second time he held up his hand then the water then the water then the waters uh, fell back in however after the strong winds apparently split the red sea there's no trace of them ever appearing again I mean, think about it if the wind was apparently holding back the ocean how did the people walk through it if it was just a solid channel of wind funneled by the mountains in the surrounding area it doesn't work and you, and you can't use tides too that doesn't work because then okay, where did the red sea event occur which is which we're still debating over that but depending but because of that you can't just simply say okay we're going to use tides for this because you don't know the exact conditions obviously robert don't trust anything by robert what science can only explain so much when it comes to stuff like this when it comes to the red sea you may say okay well it blew us it blew a channel through the red sea but what held up the Red Sea after that after that for the people to keep it to just walk through normally. I mean what I mean normally I mean they're not blown like the being like they're experiencing a hurricane. Something had to keep the had to keep the ocean separated. And keeping in mind that it was that the wall that the wall that the ocean was described as walls of water to the left and to the right. Something had to somehow keep all that water from falling back in, forming this narrow corridor. Okay, not just a gentle sloping uh, thing separated by the ocean. That's not that's not how it works. That's not how it's described. You can't just pick and choose what to believe because that, that's when things start contradicting and then self-interpretations just starts messing everything up. So whilst there may be some you could say natural exp- some scientific uh, explanation for what happened there for the Red Sea incident and the ten plagues, there's there's nothing really. That, that science will only explain things to a certain degree. Like I said, the eighth plague may have been explained by science. The, big, the parting of the Red Sea may have been explained by science, but everything else that happened, the, the reason why the Red Sea continued to remain open whilst the people kept walking through it fine, and all the other plagues, because there, there wasn't just one, there were ten, there were nine, the nine other plagues that occurred, there's something a bit beyond science when it comes to explaining them. And you know what, that's fine, because... With this staff, you shall do my wonders it's it would be foolish of us to assume that with science we can explain everything that happens i mean i'm sure there are too i'm sure there aren't very many people out there who are so short-sighted and prideful that they think that they can find out everything or have an answer for everything out there obviously there'll be things that we can't explain and i'm not trying to induce a god of the gap theory here i mean there will always be something that we won't understand out there and that's fine Science will explain things up to a certain degree, but then after that, you need to start admitting that the hand of God took place. Because again, I, I would I would like to see people try and figure out the numerical odds for all of those ten plagues to happen one after the other in ra- in rapid succession. We know that this sort of stuff had to happen in less than a year because the chronology of the Bible only allows for Moses returning when he was eighty uh, to go, go to go confront Pharaoh with Aaron, and then the. Uh, then Moses going up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, they all happened within the same year. So if someone can figure out just the odds of that happening, even though such events have never occurred in history again, I would like to see those, because because the sheer irregularity of all these things occurring at once shows that it was maybe a little bit more than natural explanations can provide answers for. RW is going to probably do a video about this at some point in the future. The problem when it comes to trying to apply science to everything, including things that shouldn't have science, the problem with that is, and he'll touch, he'll tell you, he'll touch, you'll experience the topic better than me, is that you start getting answers based more around materialism than and a godless answer. Yeah, that's it for this video. If you like this video, please do give a like. Please do share my videos with you. Please do comment. If you think of them, any other things you want me to do, please subscribe to my channel so you can see more of content. And please ring the bell to keep up with my gigantic uh, theories videos. Next episode, I'll be talking about. 
the um, I'll be talk the next ep next episode I'll be talking again about the ten plagues, but it's a little bit different this time because I've in in my research I found that the ten plagues they weren't just natural okay, again I already debunked them as a natural events here due to the sheer probability of them occurring, but they weren't just random plagues. There was actually a reason why they occurred the specific way they did. But I'm going to explore that and explain it to you in the next video. So see you next video, comrades. Until then.